You want to go? Three or two? Four. It's going to be a good game, too. Yeah. It's so good to see you, bud. Awesome. Oh, Jeff will show you. Praying for him. He's got a lot going on. He cost her going. Mayonnaise, oh, mayonnaise is up by 400. He got him. Thank you, Jay. What a blessing. Wow, that's right spot on with today's uh, message, guys, from Psalm 34, which I memorized probably when I was, I want to say, a junior in college. And a lot of uh, stuff going on. We're going to read the passage together out loud. I've got more handouts. Did everyone get your handout? And do we have... uh, are the mics hot? We got the microphones too. I might, might take one for up here and then because I got a um, something cool happening here in a second. And then uh, let's see here. We're going to read the scripture out loud together, guys. This is very, very important part of our time together because this is God's word. So let's read this together. Psalm 34. We'll start with the words, I will bless. We don't need to read the, the precursor there. Psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. So let's start with I will. Here we go, guys. Everybody read this together, young and old. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. 
O magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Verse 13, keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked. Those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. This is God's holy word. May it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So the first question takes us into context. What's going on in Psalm 34? What's going on in David's life that would compel him to write this psalm under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God? Why, question, could David bless the Lord at all times? This psalm opens up with two words, I will. Everyone say, I will. When you hear those two words, you're hearing two words of volition, two words of decisive choice, deliberate, intentional choice. I will. So what follows that those two words is usually something about me, right? I will live my best life. I will. What's the, the most famous song sung at funerals? What is it? I did it. Sing it with me, guys. I way. Go Google that. It's the most famous song sung at funerals. Please don't sing that at my funeral. Why well, you got to write some stuff down beforehand so they don't embarrass you, man. I don't want to get up out of that box and, you know, smack someone in the face, right? But that is the most famous song. I will, but David doesn't go toward himself. This whole psalm is toward the Lord. He says, I will, and then look at this next statement, bless the Lord. But then he says, what does it mean to bless the Lord? It simply means to exalt the Lord, to make much of the Lord, to glorify the Lord, to adore the Lord, to, we'll look at this word in a little bit, magnify the Lord, extol the Lord, to praise the Lord. I will, I will deliberately, volitionally, intentionally bless the Lord. And then how often? Here's the frequency. At all times. Everyone say at all times. At all times. This is extreme, guys. This is all the time. What's he thinking? What was Paul thinking when he said, pray without ceasing? Rejoice evermore. In everything, give thanks. What did that mean, at all times? And then he reinforces it. Remember the prose of the Proverbs. Remember the poetic literature of the Hebrews. He says in a parallel here, <clears throat> his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So, chapter 1 wants to know what's in your wallet. <clears throat> King David wants to know what's in your mouth. <clears throat> he says, let me tell you what's continually in my mouth. His praise. I will 
bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. What comes out your mouth reflects what's in your heart. You said out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's in here is going to come out here. So who are you blessing? Who are you exalting? Who are you magnifying? Who are you making much of? Who are you creating a taste for? Who are you blessing? Who are you praising? What are you praising? What is that thing that comes out your mouth? Whatever's coming out your mouth is what's going on in your heart, is what your life is orbited around. It's what you worship. And David said, I will bless the Lord. The Lord. Everyone say the Lord. The Lord. 25 times I counted the Lord in this chapter. And that's like the Lord plus pronouns of the Lord. He plus some verses it's two or three times. And it's also the Lord, the same name used to Jesus in the New Testament. Priest. Wow. David knew whom he was speaking to. It's wow. capital L O R D. Wow. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He didn't know the cross, but he knew the, the holiness of it, like the Lord's Prayer. And he tells us in Romans, Paul tells us just as David told us in this verse, I will confess the Lord with my mouth. It's a holy, repentant relationship that only the cross could give to us. Yeah. Wow. And David goes on. But the crazy thing is, I was watching Pastor Jay preach on Samuel, and he was preaching on the exact passage in Samuel. What was going on was Psalm 34. So he not just wrote a song about it, but Jay shared just real quick what's going on in a certain cave in front of a certain Philistine ruler who didn't think much of David because of what they did to their dude. <laughs> Check this out, y'all. Uh, psalm 34 is, uh, is a psalm of rededication. It is... Uh, if you study David's life, 1 Samuel 20, uh, he, you, you just sense this man is tired. He's on the run. He's, uh, Saul has attempted to murder him several times already. And so David's, he just finds himself, uh, and, and if you study his life up to this point, he was very God-focused. Um, if you look at 1 Samuel 17, when he killed Goliath, he, he mentions God and his power and his might over and over again he never talks about himself he never talks about his weapons except for you know i've got a little sling but he he talks much about how god is his his strength and his his courage well in first samuel 20 he loses that god focus he goes down to a uh, little city of nob which is a priestly city and he he's on the run he doesn't know what to do so he lies to the priest um uh ahimelech um, just gets himself, he, he, basically he goes from God focus to David focus. And he asks Ahimelech, he said, Hey, I need a weapon. He's like, well, I've got the sword of Goliath back here behind the ephah. You can have it. He says, give me that. There's nothing like it. So David goes from God focus to David focus. He goes from a sling to, to Goliath's sword. And then of course, uh, at the end of chapter 20, he's like, maybe I can find asylum down with the Philistine King. He goes down there and just making a mess of things he tries to take matters into his own hands if you will so david escapes there and he finds himself in a cave in southern judea in adulam that's where he writes psalm 34 so if you put this into context david's basically coming back and saying wow you know lord uh this was this was not good i tried to take matters into my own hands i tried to fix it i'm coming back to just say you know what i'm going to praise you no matter what I'm going to praise you at all times. I'm going to give you the glory at all times. And I love what John Phillips says about this psalm. David, he's in this cave. He's probably got his little harp, you know, and he turns the cave into a cathedral. And he, he writes Psalm 34. That's, that's the backdrop for Psalm 34. Powerful. Thank you. What, isn't that awesome, guys? So <clears throat> the fact that God could be, <clears throat> it sure helped me get ready. Because I also help a lot of the guys that are teaching the Wednesday and the Word at the different locations. I help them to get ready in, um, uh, and, and try, you know, try to have some notes and try to have some background. It helps to know the context of Scripture. So guys, I just talked about how powerful it was David's praise was going up. <clears throat> well, the fact is his praise was going up 
when all hell was coming down on them. So it's not just saying, I will bless the Lord at all times, and just say, you know, every one, every one of us said these words multiple times. But it's being able to praise the Lord, choosing to praise the Lord when your emotions don't feel it, when you got depression that's coming in hard, when you got loneliness, when you have people that you thought loved you hating on you. So here this guy is roaming from cave to cave, being chased by the guy that he wanted to be grow up like. His father-in-law, King Saul, his mentors trying to kill him. And then he finds himself, got the Philistines after him. I mean, when you walk into the town, the, 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 you, you, you killed their favorite son, Goliath, in Gath, they might not be too happy to see you. But David, so what does he do? He starts spitting and drooling in his beard. He starts climbing up on the walls, jumping on the furniture. And, in, you know, to us, we're like, oh, he's just goofing off, you know, grab him, kill him, whatever. To them, in that day, there was a lot of superstition around crazy people. It could go really bad really quick if some crazy person possessed by some spirit, starts killing all y'all. So they just get them out of there. They don't want to, they don't want to cross that line. You know, they knew there was, they always knew there was something different about the, the Hebrews, right? And they're like, this is their, kind of their guy. So we're just going to kind of like, we don't want to end up, you know, like Goliath did, whatever. And so, but David, he, 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 does, he takes the whole thing into his own hands. So something happened in that cave. David encountered a greater king than the king Saul who was trying to kill him, a greater ruler than King Abimelech, and that's, by the way, a, is a title uh, for the, the Philistine kings, much like Abimelech is like a pharaoh or a Herod. Uh, the, the gentleman's actual name was, was Ahish, this king Achish, A-C-H-I-S-H. -H. So he finds himself in the presence of a greater king than all those guys. The king of kings of the Lord of lords. And so, how could David bless the Lord at all times when all this is breaking out in his life? He is a fugitive surrounded by a motley crew of fugitives. Some rough men. David's mighty men. We learn about them a little bit later. So, then he says, verse 2, look at this. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. Wow. What does that mean? To boast. What do you boast about? How can you boast in the Lord, guys? How's that work? Anybody? <laughs> David. Now, here you go. Here you go, you. When he came against Goliath, he says, you come at me with shield and sword, but I come that's with right. you with the Lord. Wow. So that's yeah. that's how we start. He's come back to his roots. Yeah, in that cave. So could be God just took him back to, hey, listen, remember when I called you, when you were that, that you know, pointless little shepherd boy that everyone passed by. We th we're going to go for the older boys of Jesse. And you were this, this little squirt. Remember what I did for you when I delivered you. Remember those psalms you wrote that, you know, praising me was just you and God and the stars and a bunch of sheep and a bunch of lions, tigers, and bears trying to kill those sheep. Steve, go right here. Pass him the mic, Dave. Okay, go ahead. Paul said it. Well, Paul said it too, boasting in the Lord. If I can boast, I'll boast in the Lord. It says, it says in... Uh, Galatians, I think, 6.14, he says, I'm going to boast only in the cross of Christ. That's what I boast in. And so here David said, my, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord. This is what I'm proud about. This is my badge of honor. God Almighty, in the Lord. You have that statement over it again, guys. In the Lord. Look at this. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Go ahead, Gray, you step in. So you asked the question, how, yeah. could, how could he boast? in the in the lord yeah. and i'm just struck by the fact that you know we're david's every man and every woman wow. that that lives today like the struggles that he had yes he was struggling for his life he was struggling for what he thought he wanted he he had been promised something he thought that was of god and it wasn't working out mm. in his time and in his comfort level and being strong willed and blessed by god he thought he could do it but God is always there for us when we come back. The beauty of this story is not David falling away. Mm. It's the openness of God to take us back at whatever place we find ourselves in when we, when we get that truth reignited in us. That's and so it's, just, it's just beautiful um, because, well, I just know, you know, I think I have struggles and I want things to work out a particular way, but God's way is not usually my way. And if I'm patient, he gets the glory. 
If I'm impatient, I'm seeking glory. And, and he, was, he was so willing just to give it back to God. That's, that's, we need to humble ourselves like David humbled right. himself in that cave. If any of you all got to the point, you've taken it into your hands enough, and God just stops you and says, hey, just stop. And David came to that point where he had handled it. I got this, and he didn't get this. He, need, you know, he, he came to the point where he was humbled. And we're going to see David referred to as humble. This poor man afflicted all these things in this psalm. This psalm, by the way, guys, is one of the votive, that's V-O-T-I-V-E psalms. It's one of the psalms with the alphabets of the Hebrew, uh, of the Hebrew language. It's called um, <clears throat> alliterated to the side of it, like Psalm 25, like Psalm 119. It's really a fascinating a piece of literature that is was also a tool with a Hebrew alphabet. It's called an acrostic of the Hebrew letters on the side. It's a memory tool. They didn't have the books we have today, right? They didn't have all the reading and all the literature and the access to all that. So the, the Hebrews created psalms and songs that were beautifully alliterated. We can't see it in the English language, but it's all over in the Hebrew language. So David's creating something to really sink in. And also... So you can hide God's word in your heart. Way there's memory tools you can remember Scripture with. So we should be utilizing those. Um, those of you who've taught in education, you know how to teach people ways to, to you know, one run, two zoo, you know, three tree, ways to remember. And that's kind of what he had here in the Hebrew. It's broken up into two parts if you're taking notes. Part one, this is from Phillips, is a song, verses 1 through 10. Part two is the sermon, verses 11 through 22. The first part is devotional. The second part is doctrinal. Part one shows us the grace of God. Part two shows us the government of God. So there's all kinds of rich principles in here. But look at this statement. Um, <clears throat> the word boast is the word we get, uh, my soul shall boast, the word halal, which is what we get our word hallelujah. Everybody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah used 165 times in some form in the Bible. It is. And so David was humbled by what was happening in his life. Rather than be bitter, be vengeful, where's God? What are you doing? Why am I here? David was boastful in Christ, in God. He was humbled. He was broken. He was, uh, he was looking up his confidence. Remember last week, in this will I be confident. One thing I've asked of God. What's your one thing? Psalm 27, 4. To behold the beauty of God. So David was, was almost like Pastor said, Jay said. He was recalibrating. He was realigning. Going back to who he was. A son of the living God. Instead of being king running the show himself, he remembered he was a child of the king. And that God was in control. So he goes on. Look at this next question, too. <clears throat> Excuse me, this text. He says this. <clears throat> when you get connected with God and your praise is on him, and that's your choice, and you realize how big he is and how good he is and how much you need him, you know what you naturally want to do? You want to bring others into that. It's easy to bring others into gossip, isn't it? Into other things, and to bring them down into, into foolish talk or angry talk about politics and stuff that makes us mad. But what does David do? Look at verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. There's the Lord again. What does it mean to magnify? What? To expound. You know, this is as simple as looking at a magnifying glass. So if a magnifying glass, if 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 there is a if Dwayne here, if I if if I put him under a magnifying glass, does it change his height and weight and size? No. It doesn't change anything about him, but what happens? See him closer. So what a magnifying glass does is it makes the object that it's magnifying bigger to my perception. So David says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's look at how big and how grand and how great 
God is. <clears throat> that's exactly right. Yeah. Take that. Take that. Oh, wow. That's so good. That's right. It shines more light. Excellent. So David says, but look at this, this idea of joining together. Magnify the Lord with me. And then he says, let us exalt his name together. Going back to his name. His name is his character, his attributes. How often do we exalt and do we praise God for who he is? We're, we live in a culture consumed with, give us this day our daily bread. But how often do we just spend time loving on God and adoring him, exalting him, magnifying who he is, his attributes, his love. What are some attributes of God, guys? Throw them at me. Yeah, they're coming. Keep coming. Joy. Uh, magnify the Lord. His grace. His holiness. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. You know, yeah. Hey, what about this? Why do we go to church? You know what church is? It's a big magnification party. We're getting together, and we're all exalting his name together. So there better be some life there. And my, I mean, I get the elbow sometimes from my girls because I actually like sing the song that's on the screen. Yeah, it's, it's out of tone, okay? I'll admit that. But I sing it. <clears throat> and if I sing it loud and get excited and do not raise your hands, I mean, I don't think that's biblical, guys, okay? Watch out. Don't get me started. It's kind of weird. Like, sometimes you're the oddball for singing praise to God. For magnifying the Lord. And David said, look, this is what we do together. Magnify the Lord to me. Who's your praise partner? Who are you going to call today and say, magnify the Lord to me. Let us exalt his name together. <clears throat> Let me tell you what that'll do for your conversation and for your relationship. It'll take it to the whole next level. When you start praising God with someone, let's just stop and praise God. I know about you got that those problems, okay? <laughs> They're going to still be here when we finish praising God. But guess what's going to happen? We're going to see through this magnifying glass how big he is, and those problems are going to get real small. They're going to get tiny because God's so big. Go, Ralph, hand him that mic right there. Yeah. Abandon. There's another word uh, used in the Psalms, I think maybe mm. one time that I can, can remember or recognize, and that's exalt, E-X-U-L-T. Well, what's the difference between exalt and exalt? Exalt means with wild abandon, like what we do when we go to the, you know, a Wake Forest football game. Have you ever heard the announcer say, ladies and gentlemen, if this is your first time here at uh, the stadium to watch our Demon Deacons, we might get a little excited, but don't be alarmed. Some of us may jump up and down. You may have noticed that some paint their faces, you know, black and gold and look kind of crazy. Don't get upset. Okay, so sit down, enjoy the game. If you don't want to stand up and praise the team, that's okay. But let the game begin. Why do we have to make those kinds of apologies when we go to church on Sunday for non-believers who might be there or newcomers or whatever? Oh. Church is for the believers. Worship is the expression of the believers, and we should never have to apologize be ashamed, embarrassed, reticent, hesitant to praise the Lord with wild abandon. That's good, Ralph. Woo! Thank you. Wow. Hey, I think Brother Bob wants to add something. Yeah, hand that, don't, don't, don't hand him the mic. Yeah, do it, do it. Uh, well, you're only allowed to do that in church. Uh, well, hey, hey, listen. David was in a cave. You know, that's a good sermon title, by the way. Dave in a cave, right? Hey, he was in the cave. He was running for his life. He's got people outside that want to murder him. Yeah. Paul and Silas are in prison. What are they doing getting a praise on like that? Of all places. So exalt me is the, is the Hebrew word ruim, R-U-W-M, which means to raise up above all else, <clears throat> to lift up high. There's something contagious, guys, about praising God. Okay? If you don't believe me, just ask the walls of Jericho. How'd it go for them? 
They may not have had Musimini, the flautist there, you know, marching around with his flute seven times, but they had the, the whole army of Israel, the people who were not, definitely not, you know, equipped for war like the ones inside the wall. But they, they praised God, and they sang his praises. More enemies were vanquished, by the way, in the Old Testament by the armies of God, the armies of Israel, in the praise of God than they had another way. There's a power to that. Go right here. Preacher, hand him that mic. To praise God, and the enemy ended up destroying herself. The children of Israel sat back and watched the battle, and never yeah. even had to fight. The enemy yeah. ended up destroying herself because wow. they started with praising God. And to something else. Wow. Amen. So, <clears throat> um, so here you have. By the way, something made you a fan of that team. I don't know what it was. You were a little guy. Some romantic thing happened where you became a fan. And to this day, your blood, when you walk in that, that, that restaurant and your team's on, you will stop. You'll say, honey, I got to go to the restroom real quick. And it'll be a little longer visit than normal, okay? And, but something, something happened in David early on that turned his heart toward the living God. And he is finding that there's a revival that's happened in this cave. The still small voice of Almighty God is meeting him, and he's meeting with his maker to the point where he says, man, we're all going to get after this together. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. There's a power in collective praise. There's a power in collective prayer. Something so powerful about it. And David is tapping in that. Then he describes it, verse 4, I saw the Lord. I sought the Lord. What does it mean to seek God? There's so much in here. What does it mean to seek the Lord? We have this all throughout the Bible. Are you a seeker of God? You stuck? Seek. Yeah, seeking you will find. Seek the doctor. Seek the counselor. Seek the parent. Seek whoever. But what, when are we going to start seeking God? He's there. Does he have any answers? Does he have any power? Does he, can he do anything for me? Can he do anything in me? Is he stronger than my enemies? And yet we seek everything else. And David says, I sought the Lord. And let me tell you what happens if you seek God. He hears you. The king of kings, the Lord of lords. I guarantee you in that cave, David, even though he was a little bit out of range, he didn't get he didn't get tabbed with a bunch of roaming charges. I guarantee you he didn't get you know extra... Charges on that phone, you know, you think about that. You got to make the call, you got to pay the, the toll. Unlimited access by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So he says, I sought the Lord, he heard me. What does God do when he hears you? He delivered me from all my fears. But it's just going to what your fears are. Look at verse 5. <clears throat> they looked to him and were radiant. What a word. The word in the Hebrew is nahar, and it means to shine, to beam. <coughs> Excuse me. It means to burn, to sparkle, to light. They look to him. What happens when you look to God? His light, the light of his countenance starts to come onto you. And I think one preacher went on TikTok and talked about getting sunburned recently. <laughs> you did it, didn't you? And you talked about Moses in 34 of Exodus. That was the idea of this radiance. You know? What was that you said? Something about the glory of God? Take that mic. This is too good. <laughs> yeah, I was just talking about when Moses came down off that mountain. He'd been with the Lord so long that his face was glowing. And looked at him as like, what's up with Moses? His face is glowing. Um, and I just, um, that day, what did I do? When was that, Sunday? Yeah, I think you were out in the sun. Yeah, I went and played softball Sunday, and my face was roasted. You were bright. And I don't know, I just used that illustration as, uh, but folks should look at my face and know that I've been in the sun too long. And um, I think folks, you know, obviously it was Moses, and he was up there not necessarily face to face with god but i think in many ways we can apply that to our lives that are we radiating god's glory to the world through our actions through our testimony 
uh, through our love for others. Um, and so um, I keep thinking about that song when I was a kid. There was a song that said, uh, let the joy of Jesus put a smile upon your face. Let the joy of Jesus, every little frowny race, proclaim is something and a something, something. With a let it, anyway, face. the point let being, let are. Christ be shown in your life, on your face, reflecting his glory to the world. I don't know. Yeah, that's great. I hey. turned it into a TikTok video. Hey, how about, do you, hey, here's a question. Do you have the glow of God? You know, we spend all our time talking about, and jump in, Bob, we spend all our time talking about, oh, I wonder if he's a Christian. I wonder where he is on his, in his faith. I mean, <clears throat> What is someone who loves Jesus? I mean, in that cave, there was no doubt. Dude had the glow of God. Do you have the glow of God? I mean, how long does it take for me to hang around you to find out you love Jesus? I mean, this is getting real. See? Jay Wooden. S-U-N burned. See? He was not S-I-N burned. He wasn't sin burned. He was sun burned. S-O-N burned. Man, I had to turn that into something there. Go ahead, Bob. Jump in. The glow of God. I will only know the radiant glow of God coming from you when I know you love me, too. Wow. That's a great way to show the glow of God. How do you love others? When First John, First John says, hey, you say you love God and hate your neighbor, you're a liar. How do you say you love God who you can't see and you hate your neighbor who you can't see? I mean, just read, you just quoted 1 John. I mean, you know, so it's how you love your neighbor. It's how you love those you're closest to, those your family. I mean, how can we have family that we hate? Wait a second. You get along great, man. You're sweet. You're, you're a sweetie pie to that, you know, that waitress, man. But you go home and you hate on your people you're supposed to be loving and building up and encouraging. But the glow of God, the glow of God, how's that shine on others, you know? David, you said something. Austin Cavanis learned of me. Oh, what you do? You're we're encouraged. Wow. These guys Amen. were encouraged. That's quite a radiant. Lorenzo, Boy, who's had a lot of health challenges lately, says he delivered me from all my fears. Wow, wow, yeah, and it, yeah, it's so good, man. Um, so there's a radiance. Look, their faces were not ashamed. I love that. You know what does it say in uh, Psalm, Proverbs twenty-eight? The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. There's no shame. There's a boldness. There's a radiance. This poor man cried. Dear David's calling himself a poor man. Unless you become poor, you'll never experience the riches of God. He was a shepherd. That's right. He understood that poverty, but he understood from that and from all this stuff going on how, how impoverished of spirit he was. Jesus said, Matthew 5, 3, the greatest sermon by the greatest... Pastor, preacher, by God himself, is blessed are the poor in spirit. Completely counterintuitive. <clears throat> unless you become poor, unless you come to the end of yourself, you'll never come to the beginning with God. Amen? Unless you are completely empty, he can never fill you. He will not fill a full vessel. You got all you need? You don't need Jesus? Well, let's see how that goes for you. Let's see how that works out for you. But David said, this poor man cried. This is humility. Humility is not seeing myself as everyone else sees me and, and being this kind of facade of, oh, woe is me. Humility is seeing me as God Almighty sees me. Someone who desperately needs him. Not all the stuff he does for me, but I need him. And we're going to get that deeper here. He says, this poor man cried. The Lord heard him and saved him. Wow. Who needs saving? You don't think you need saving, you're in worse trouble, okay? And saved him out of all his troubles. Verse 7, wow. The angel of the Lord. By the way, those words are uh, what we call a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. In form here, Jesus appeared to Joshua. Jesus appeared to Abraham, okay? In, in pretty powerful pictures. And he's saying, the angel of the Lord which is Jesus himself and his heavenly host, what does he do? Encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. The irony of this is King Saul is encamped all around those caves trying to murder David. He's got all of his mighty men, which, which are, you know, <clears throat> hundreds and thousands more than David's mighty men trying to kill him encamped around. And in that moment, David says, the angel of the Lord encamps around me. 
to deliver me. And then verse 8. Say it with me, guys. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. When you are in a cave, when all hell breaks loose, when your relationships are broken, when your life is broken, and you're struggling, and you're lonesome, and you're depressed, and you're at the end of your, your you know, your enemies over here want to kill you, and you've got enemies surrounding you to want to kill you, at that point in time, Sunday school anecdotes, they don't work as well. And David says, taste, taste and see that the Lord is good. Okay, so he, he brings a tangible, personal picture and view of tasting God. What does that mean? Anyone here tasted God's goodness? Tasted. Go ahead, Jeff, right here. Pass it up, Mike. Good for me is him reminding me through all my life and struggles and, mm. and just poor choices. He still shows up and reminds me how much he loves me and how f just faithful and true he is and just how he melts my heart and reminds me um, just, just how awesome of a God we serve and just how great his love is. So good. There's a look at the, the second part of the verse. <clears throat> it tells you a little bit more about what it means to taste and see. By the way, how many food analogies are in Scripture? God uses the food a lot to try to show us who He is, okay? We did one a couple weeks ago in Psalm 19, talking about the Word of God. And He says, sweeter also than honey, even the honeycomb. What else? Wow. Jeremiah said, you know, God's Word, I saw God's Word and I did eat it, and it was sweet to my soul. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the living water. He says to, to the lady in, in John 4, if you drink of me, you'll never be thirsty again. The promise then was a land of milk and honey. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How's your tasting, by the way? What do we do? What's that? There you go. Yeah. Uh, Hebrews 5 talks about getting after that meat. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes, desire, crave the pure milk of the word, that you may grow by it. You won't grow unless you taste and see that the Lord is good. And, and unless you go through what that, is, what that means, that's explained in the next part of the verse. Blessed. Everyone say blessed. <clears throat> blessed. The first word of the longest book of the whole Bible is blessed. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. So guess what, guys? To trust is to taste. To taste is to trust. Very simple. We complicate it. What did we do for this yesterday, Truth Warrior intern? Hand him the mic, David. What did I start asking you guys at that restaurant? Remember? Marcus started talking about his dad's spaghetti. What's your favorite meal? Best food oh, you've yeah. ever had? you got 30 seconds to tell me. To put a taste in my mouth, your favorite food. And what did you say? Remember? I said steak. He said steak. A little bit louder for the guys in the back. I said steak. What was the point of that exercise? To really acknowledge that, like, the food the food that we eat, we can internalize it. We can taste it. We can think back to the times where we had it, where we were, what it was. Um, and basically tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. You know, or do we have those same things in our life where we can see where the Lord has been good in our life? When we followed him and, um, you know, the Lord protects the righteous. David was righteous and the Lord protect him, protected him even when he was on the run from God or was on the run from God, on the run from those trying to kill him. But the Lord was always there for him. So it was a, a cool little food analogy that we did. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a tangible, tactile tasting. So we got foodies. We have entire food channels, food magazines. We have entire food. There's a whole world out there, and you're looking at the number one consumer of that, okay? Let me tell you. But here's the question. How hungry am I for God? How? Why are we called salt, guys? Because what does salt do? It, it, it seasons, and it makes you thirsty. And how is my tasting of God? This is real personal. 
This is not guy stuff. Guy stuff is how are you doing fine, how are you doing fine, thank you, how are you doing fine, thank you, how are you doing, how are you doing, how are you doing. Hey, how are the kids? How's you doing? How's school? Where are you going to college? Well, I don't really care. I'm just asking you this because I'm an old person. I want to ask everyone that that's your age. How about ask someone this? Have you tasted the Lord? Why do we have the Lord's Supper? Why does God give us a feast to remember what he did, to go back into that sacred moment where he paid for my sins? Why are we eating bread and drinking the, the juice, the grape juice? Why? So we can taste so when it comes into even our taste buds, this is real. This goes into my body. I digest this. This is real. What my Savior did, he shed real blood on that cross. A real body was broken for me. Hallelujah. And what he's invited me to do is to come into relationship with him. So this is an expression of intimacy. Psalms 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. By the way, I can't tell you about something I never tasted. Amen? I can try to describe it. I can show you pictures. But what powerful thing it is when I'm with him, beholding his beauty, tasting of him, drinking a living water, and then I'm sharing that with others. I mean, is this something anyone even wants? If they see me, they're like, that's, the, you know, wow, I want that. I want what he has. Man, there's a contagiousness about it. Because I'm going to tell you something. A new restaurant doesn't open up in this city that's got good food. And how many of us are going? And how quick can we get on there? And how can I get a reservation? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rearrange my schedule to get to eat that food and to order that combo number seven or whatever it is. By the way, has anyone ever had a Dario dog before? How about that? How about those Dario dogs? Let's thank these guys right here. Wow. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> I used to think all these out-of-town people come in here, you know, to hear a good word and maybe, you know, you know, hear Stu get up here and, you know, teach Wednesday in the Word and all that. Well, they really come here for the Dario dogs, I found out later. You know, I suspect. But, you know, but think about that. Just we even talking about that, you're, you're already thinking, Steve's already thinking about those onions and the, that, that toasted bun. The all beef dog, you know, high quality beef, which has gone up 400%. So pray for all these guys in the restaurant industry and support them, guys. It's tough right now. But you've tasted. I like the jumbo one without the bun, sauerkraut, everything on it. <clears throat> Whoa, don't get me started. You're like, Stu's had one of those. Likes it. Well, here's a question. Am I that excited about my relationship with Christ? Man, great. I can't wait to call you, man. You're going to believe what I read this morning. God just hit me like a ton of bricks. This is amazing. Have you ever thought about how Christ meets you such and such? Tasting and seeing the Lord is good. Go, Jamal, quick. Hand in the mic. Right. Here we go. Here's one. When um, we're talking about tasting, heard uh, R.C. Sproul say um, he was talking to an atheist. And atheists was giving him the business like, oh, your God is this, your God is that, whatever, whatever. And um, R.C. Sproul was talking about this guy who was eating an apple. He didn't say a word. He just kept eating on the apple, kept eating on the apple. And the other guy was like, so what's your response? I just was trashing your God, and you don't have anything to say about it. He kept eating on the apple. He's like, okay, well, I'm, begun, I'm eating on this apple. Can you tell me how sweet this apple is? Can you tell me how it tastes? Can you tell me about the texture? Can you tell me about everything uh, that, that the, wow. the juice is in this apple? And the atheist said, no. So how can we relate that to God? We don't really have to say all these kind of scriptures and, and testimonies, which is good. But one simple question we can ask an atheist or a non-believer is, have you tasted God? Have you experienced him for yourself? Have you researched him for yourself? Have you checked him out for yourself? And a lot of times, just like Lee Strobel, who was an atheist, when people look out for God, they come to find him. Yeah. Wow. This is so good. Great illustration. So, yeah, real quick. Oh. Yeah, just, uh, yeah. Basically, a try it, you'll like it. Those of us that are a little more mature may remember the, the live cereal commercial with Mikey in it, right? Mm -hmm. They said, we said, what's this? It's some cereal. It's supposed to be good for you. They were, they were, they were running from the cereal. And they, so they said, well, let's get Mikey. Mikey tries it, and he likes it. So everybody, oh, he likes it. So everybody starts eating and enjoying the cereal. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing with this. Somebody has told, has told about the Lord, and they're kind of skeptical, right? Try it, you'll like it. That's, That's good. a pretty good welcome Love comment. It. Yeah, man. So how am I wetting the appetite in others? For the goodness of God. 
How have you tasted the goodness of God? You know, just write that, just circle verse 8, memorize it, and then just ask God how you have tangibly tasted his goodness. I know we want to talk about how, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket and all this, these evil people out here corrupting this and that. But how has God's goodness been tasted by you in your life? You know, it's, it's real personal. To do that, get with him. And then guess what's going to happen? It's going to bubble out and share that with others. The goodness of God. Let me tell you about how I've tasted God's goodness. And it's one of those things you taste, there's nothing else that can satisfy. And David realized that. Then he says this, fear the Lord. You as saints. There's no want to them that fear him. The idea of fearing God. You know, maybe another word is reverence. You know, maybe maybe it's not this crouching down like where he's going to strike me, but it's this love and respect and this bigger view of who God is, being in awe of God. He says, Fear the Lord, you as saints. That's the summary, by the way, the whole book of Proverbs, the whole Bible is to fear the Lord. Uh, there's no want, there's no lack to those who fear him. Look at verse 10. The young lions lack and suffer hunger. Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Even the young lions, <clears throat> strong, but they're going to come short. But if you seek the Lord, to fear the Lord is to seek the Lord. To fear the Lord is to taste the Lord. To see the Lord. To magnify the Lord. All those things. Come, you children. Listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Here's what's going on. David gets all his mighty men, these rugged men of war, these ruffians. They're probably quite vulgar, probably quite intense. They're probably saying things they shouldn't say. Language they shouldn't use about Saul, who's trying to kill all of them. And they're, they're all this. And David gets them around and says, come, you children. In this cave, this cathedral of praise, he says, let me show you the fear of the Lord. What does it look like? Who is man that desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Verse 12. Keep your tongue from evil. Wow, it starts right in the mouth. He says, your praise will be in my mouth, right? Um, he says, keep your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from speaking Deceit. Probably rough for these ruffians to hear they got to watch their language. Because what your language reflects, what's inside. Okay? Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the right. He takes it right back to God's eyes. His ears are open to their cry. He sees you. He hears you. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, the Lord hears, delivers them from all their troubles. Look at verse 18. The Lord is near to those who are of a broken heart and save such as of a contrite spirit. You want God to be close to you? You want to be close to God? Have a broken heart. He is close to them. I'm in Sudan in 2009 in the height of the genocide, and I'm on an airplane flying back with all our team saying, why were those people who've watched their families executed in front of them, who've been running for hundreds of miles, who think we're so great, why are they so close to God? There was an intimacy. They had tasted and seen the goodness of God, and they had nothing. And they would have died if we hadn't gone and helped drill those wells. But the Lord, that was our theme verse for that trip. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those of a contrite spirit. Psalm 34, 18, one of the key epic verses in this passage. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Verse 19. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Who recognizes that verse? It's a messianic prophecy. Uh, John 19 talks more about that. Not one bone. Hey, God knows the numbers of hairs on your head. He also knows the number of bones in your body. If you do a quick Google search, you'll find out there's 206 of those things all throughout your body, in the human body. God knows every one of them, and God's son didn't have one of those broken. In his suffering for us, evil shall slay the wicked. That's interesting, verse 21. Evil will pursue you and destroy you. You think you're pursuing it, it's pursuing you, and it will destroy you. Surrounded by people that give you the bad advice. But they would not have a perfect sacrifice. That Christ still be the perfect sacrifice. They would not yeah. take a lamb. That's exactly right. The other thing is, if we talk about, God talks about David being a man after God's own heart. He wasn't talking about when David was with Bathsheba, or what David did to Uriah, but when Nathan the prophet confronted David, he absolutely had a broken heart, repented fully, and just was so contrite, yeah. it was very obvious. Psalm 51. Yeah. Yep. You see his brokenness here. We'll see it more when we get to Psalm 51 in a few weeks. And so look at these questions. Why is God near to those of a broken heart? What does it mean to fear the Lord? Wow. I just love that thought. The people that are the worst off in life are often the people who are closest to God. 
than have the best relationship with God. The people, people are dying. Have are so much closer to God, have such greater peace than people that are living. Okay, finally, verse uh, this final chapter, this final question. How does Jesus fulfill Psalm 34, guys? To deliver, to save, to satisfy, redeem, even in trouble. You have Jesus all throughout this thing. Look at the things the Lord does for us. He encamps around us to protect us. He lifts us up. He delivers us. He redeems us. Go, Ralph. I don't know about any of you, but I, I'm sure this is the case. Uh, many of us who uh, have yards to take care of and bushes and hmm. flowers, uh, all of us probably were acutely aware that we were in a drought. And I'm sure that many of us prayed for rain. And it was no small thing that we got some really heavy rain twice this week. And I, this morning, I looked at my grass, and there's just something about the rain that the things that are green respond to, that watering from your hose that's coming from Winston-Salem, chlorinated and everything, just does not nourish in the same way. And so, you know, some, in some ways, we could take for granted the things of nature that God has given us. And I, I shout out to God, thank you for the rain that you brought, because he does promise, like in Deuteronomy, that when we go into the land that, and we're, we're, we're righteous, he will give us the rain in their season. And it's still spring, I believe, and we haven't really had that much rain. But I think he did answer the prayers of the saints and thank him for the rain. That's a great picture. That's a great picture. Thanks, Ralph. So, so if you look at this last verse, I love this. Verse, verse 21 says, those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The word condemned there, guys, is parallel to verse 22. The Lord redeems the soul of his servant. The greatest thing of all, guys, is he's our redeemer. None of those who trust in him shall be condemned. That is a almost spitting image phrase of the phrase that's used all throughout the Old and New Testament where it says the just shall live by faith. Those who trust in him will not be condemned. Think about the condemnation that's coming. Light has come to the world. Men love darkness rather than light. John 3, 17, 18, 19. 1 John 1, right? He who does not believe is condemned already. Romans 8, 1. What does it say? Say it with me if you know it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So who is Jesus in Psalm 34? I'll tell you who he is. He's the angel that encamps around about us. He's the, he's the one who delivers us from all our fears. He's the Lord who delivers, who saves us, who redeems us, who says, you are not condemned. There's no condemnation. So the question is, are we going to him? And David, centuries before, millennia before, he knows that he needs a redeemer. Right? And he knows that the son of David, who would reign and will reign one day on David's throne, King Jesus, is his redeemer. And so the question is, am I all in with him? And that means, am I tasting and seeing? And I just close with this crazy interview I did yesterday with Mr. Epperson, Big Stube, who will probably be watching this if he's not watching it right now. And the King David, who was talking here about King Jesus, who was our Redeemer. But there's the, the biggest movie in the land today is about the king of rock and roll. Elvis. Who's seen that movie? Now, I'm not telling you to go see it, but I'm going to tell you this. Because I'm going to tell you, half of you guys are going to say, oh, I hated the movie. It's terrible. I didn't like it. Nah. Well, you know what? I mean, maybe you shouldn't go to every movie to be entertained. Maybe there's a lesson. Then the other half, you're like, oh, I loved it. Mr. Everson actually loved the movie. He, he enjoyed it. Um, hands down, we're all agreed that there's not enough of his gospel impact, right? Like the sacred hymns he sang, he sang with some of the greatest gospel quartets. There, there was a profession there, you know, early on. We don't know, sit here and say, was, you know, well, we do know this. He had everything money could buy. Elvis was the king of rock and roll, the number one selling artist in history. Songs, there's entire channels dedicated to him. Everybody stand up. 
And the question is this, and I would say about that movie, by the way, just to tell you, I'm not saying go, I'm not saying don't go. I'm not going to tell you it's good or it's bad. I'm going to tell you it's important. Because like I'm telling my Truth Warrior interns, like David tells us here, there's a trajectory of seeking after things that do not satisfy. And so if you want to go see one big, massive pot of idolatry soup, you go to that movie, you'll see it. He had everything. Everything. But he hadn't really tasted and seen that the Lord is good. So you can be on top of the world in Vegas, all the money, the women, everything and everyone, your name's plastered everywhere. Or you can be all by yourself in a little cave in South Judea, surrounded by a bunch of rough, motley people, misfit toys, and just have Jesus. Which one do you want? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Tasting, trust. Have you tasted of the goodness of God? And that is the answer, you know, Psalm 34, 8 is the answer to that movie and to our souls. We're looking and longing for it, but we get bad advice, we get addicted, we get sideways, and look what happens. And every single one of us is capable of that. So this is not to point at him, because every one of us, if handed that, you don't want that wish. Oh, I wish I had, if I had all that money, hogwash. You ain't giving a penny to your church now. You're saying you're going to get a lot more money you're going to give? Hogwash. Because you're, I, I, that's your idol, see? So what do we do? We go to God. We say, we cry to the Lord. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me. Amen. What would you say? That's right. Yeah. That's great. Hey, hand that mic to the preacher right behind you. Perhaps preacher, will you pray for us today? Close us out. Yeah, so that's the that's the ultimate invitation. By the way, the whole the whole uh, fall of man starts with food, right? God said, "Enjoy my goodness, walk with me." The devil said, "God didn't say that. Eat this forbidden fruit." And what happened? The bite of the apple, like Jamal, you know. And then, but how does it all end? Flash forward to Revelation twenty one and twenty two. We're going to be eternally eating from the tree of life. So. He satisfies us. And so if there's anything in your life more satisfying to you than Jesus Christ, then run away from it. Run away from him. Run away from her. Run away from it. If it's a career, what is it? There's nothing more. What is the ultimate value to you? And David said, look, at the end of the day, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I will rejoice in the goodness of God. Amen. Pastor, pray, pray us out of here, will you? Father, it's just a joy and a pleasure each time we come together to read your word and to learn it. Father, let us always taste and see that you're good. Father, let us share your goodness with those that are around us. Let our lives be radiant, Father, that they may see your glory in us and have a desire to want to know more about it. We praise you for what you've done and praise you for your word. In Christ's name, amen. Pray with one guy before you leave, especially these young people, okay? Awesome.